like we're right at noon. And so I want to thank everybody for joining us today, especially our speaker, Chuck Wibelsik, um, with Maine Health. Uh, Chuck has uh, known Chuck for a while now, as long as I've worked for the Forest Service. And he's, um, he's a, a great field ecologist, so a great presenter, and also uh, one of the top experts on ticks in the state. So I'm really happy that he could join us today. Um, I guess I'll introduce myself as well. I'm Allison Kenodi. I'm the Director of Forest Health and Monitoring with the Maine Forest Service. And this presentation is part of our um, monthly webinar series that we are presenting um, with a mix of guest speakers and our own staff. And if you're interested in keeping up to date on those, I'd encourage you to sign up for one of our department newsletters um, the, or one of our Forest Service newsletters. We have a, a series of them, um, one aimed towards landowners, one aimed towards uh, foresters, and another towards loggers. And then internally, um, we have our own conditions reports that are um, monthly, uh, more or less monthly growing season reports on forest health conditions in the state. So the next webinar uh, is not scheduled yet, but it will be in, in June, and that'll be announced in those um, forester, logger, and landowner uh, list serves. Um, just a few uh, technical details. One is that this is being recorded and will be posted on our Forest Service YouTube channel. So just want all those attending to be aware of that before we get started. Um, if folks can mute their microphones if they're not speaking, that would be terrific. Um, and we may um, mute you if you come un unmuted during the meeting, just to let you know that. And I guess uh, with, with that, I'll let Chuck go ahead and provide any further introduction uh, to either himself or his organization and get started in his presentation because he's really who you came to hear from today. So thank you all. Great. Thanks, Allison, and also Amy for helping with the tech setup. Um, yeah, so my name is Chuck Lebelzik, and I work uh, for the, the Maine Health Institute for Research. We used to be known as the Maine Medical Center Research Institute until last year uh, when we had a, a name change. Uh, but our lab has been in place uh, here in Maine since the late 1980s, where we have worked on a lot of tick-borne and then later mosquito-borne disease surveillance and research. Uh, the presentation I'm going to give today is sort of a broad overview on tick-borne diseases for Maine. Uh, we, it is a presentation that we do in collaboration with the Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention in Augusta. And even though this is really done by people in Maine and really has sort of a Maine focus, the ecological things I'll talk about are going to be very applicable to other northern New England states. So if anybody here happens to be from Vermont or New Hampshire and you're chiming in, um, you know, there will be some some information that's relevant to those states as well. And, and then we do take this view because in a lot of ways, our ecology in northern New England is going to be a little bit different than what folks are seeing in, in either southern New England or in the mid-Atlantic. Uh, but of course, tick-borne diseases, especially diseases transmitted by the, the black-legged or deer ticks, stretch all the way down into the southeastern U.S. and, and the upper Midwest. So, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of information that's very general as well. Um, so I will get started uh, and we'll hope that teams will accommodate. So very briefly, what are ticks? So ticks, in addition to being obviously one of our most popular wild species that occur in the Northeast, are arachnids. Uh, they're not actual classic insects, but they are arachnids that are related more to spiders and mites. There are hundreds of species of, of ticks found worldwide. Um, we have approximately 90 species found in the U.S., in Maine, we know of at least um, 15 species that occur here. Most are a nuisance species, but a select group are actually considered to be more of a public health or veterinary health uh, significance. Um, there is some anecdotal data showing that they, they have existed for quite a while um, and possibly could also be parasites of, of dinosaurs based on some fossil um, examinations that have been done. So ticks are, an, uh, in general, um, an eight-legged arthropod, and they have various parts of their anatomy um, that we look at and use for diagnostic purposes. Um, in particular, when you're looking at species of ticks, one of the identifying features is what we would call the capitulum or the mouth parts. Uh, this would include 
um, the hypostome, which is actually the, the injectable syringe that would go into people or animals' bodies and, and suck blood, uh, very similar to the proboscis on a mosquito. We also have on either side of the hypostome palps, which are very commonly found in a lot of arthropods like lobsters and spiders. They're actually a type of organ that assists with um, filter feeding in in lobsters but in ticks they actually are used to help balance the tick on a host and help it um acute itself to uh to kind of where the skin is and how they can can lever themselves into into injecting their hypostone to start sucking blood with ticks uh the larval stage which we'll talk about the different life stages but the the larval stage which is the youngest active stage the first stage to hatch out of an egg are actually born with six legs when the tick molts into a nymphal stage and then further into the adult, it changes, however, to eight legs. Um, you can see on this as well, we have a part of the anatomy called the scutum or the dorsal shield. This is usually in, in the female um, life stage of the tick. This usually shows up as a dot that encompasses about half of the dorsal surface or half of the back of the tick. Um, this can be very characteristic. Coloration of the sputum helps us to identify uh, which tick species it might be, as well as the shape of the sputum, which can vary slightly among different tick species. And finally, we have the abdomen. And the abdomen, again, can be used and, and helpful with identifying because there may be certain um, uh, diagnostic features along the rim of the abdomen uh, called festoons, which look like small mortared bricks, which might be on the outer edge um, of, the, of the tick. And that also helps with identification purposes. Um, ticks, when they are in the juvenile stages, larvae and nymphs are not sexually dimorphic. So we don't assign um, males or female characteristics to them. They are simply larvae and then they're nymphs. When the ticks become adult stage, however, they become dimorphic and you can actually tell the difference between males and females. Here are presented two of the common tick species that we have in Maine, the black-legged or deer tick, and then on the right, the American dog tick. Um, in the adult stage, the deer tick is approximately the size of an apple seed, if you want to use a food metaphor. Um, the females are usually, not always, but usually slightly larger and have a characteristic black sputum, that black shield that's highlighted with a red arrow, with an overall brick red color to its body. Males have a sputum that encompasses its entire dorsal surface, um, meaning the entire of the back is covered by the sputum, and it has an overall general blackish coloration. Uh, under the microscope, this actually turns out to be more of a dark brownish color, um, but in, in reality, to the naked eye, it looks very black. Um, and, and the ticks, this tick species, uh, it's, it's more common proper name is the black-legged tick. And more often than not, specimens of this tick species will always have very dark black legs uh, in coloration. By contrast, the American dog tick on the right is a much larger tick, uh, and usually this tick will have, to the naked eye, visible some sort of white on the back. Uh, the male on the left has almost uh, vertical stripes, jagged vertical stripes, kind of similar to almost like lightning bolts in appearance that run down the length of the back in parallel, while the female has a sputum that is almost a white uh, coloration. Um, in reality, it's actually more of a lightish gray color, but to the naked eye, it looks very white. Um, and this is pretty typical for most specimens of this species and, and can be seen with the naked eye. So if you're finding ticks on you and they appear to have some form of white on the back, there's a pretty good chance that in Maine, that tick will be the American dog tick. Um, and I'm going to go into more with seasonality later, but we are right now in the primary season for dog ticks. Uh, we're coming into uh, certainly the almost the full swing of the dog tick season, which is much shorter than that of the deer tick. Um, and so ticks actually vary in size quite a bit. And, and if you think about uh, ticks, um, larvae, nymphs, and then the females of the adult life stage, it's, it's kind of a, a way to think about them as very small miniature water balloons where they can take in um, almost 10 times their original body size in blood and they expand out. And the, the females, as they engorge with blood, will actually go through quite a bit of a color change, starting out with, with adult stage deer ticks, as you can see here on the lower right, as a, a reddish brick red color. Um, they go through a phase where they actually go through a tannish coloration, 
uh, a darkish gray coloration and finally settling onto kind of a pale gray when they get fully engorged. And this may be um, in the adult stage of the tick, seven to eight days after attaching and starting feeding. Uh, we frequently see ticks this large on wildlife species like white-tailed deer that we see at tagging stations in the fall or frequently find uh, ticks to size on pets that are not treated with a lot of the topical uh, tick killing compounds that, that are, are commonly prescribed. Um, usually it's rare to find ticks that are that large coming off of people. Most people will find the ticks uh, before they get to be about that size. And, and when the adult stage deer ticks are this large, um, again, going back to a food metaphor, uh, they are about the size of a large blueberry in size. So they're they're noticeable, you know, and people can see them. Um, obviously on pets, again, if you have a dog or a cat that has lighter colored fur, the ticks tend to show up a little bit better than if the ticks, uh, than if the animals themselves have um, kind of a darker coloration to them. So just something to consider as well when you're examining your animals, because certainly the other thing to take in with this is that although this is a presentation really focusing on human public health, you know, these ticks uh, and a lot of the diseases that affect people are also ones that can affect many of our companion animals, uh, specifically dogs, uh, but also cats and to a lesser extent livestock as well. You know, tick checks should be given um, frequently on these animals in addition to us when we come in from, from the field. So how do ticks bite? OK, so they have a long period. Ticks oftentimes, unlike black flies or mosquitoes, don't bite right away. They frequently will attach, find themselves onto you most uh, people get ticks occurring on themselves um, low down. And, and the common entryway for ticks to get at you is around the ankle level. Because of that, we frequently tell folks as a public health measure to cover up, uh, pull your socks up over the cuffs of your pants, or if you're doing a lot of active field work, wearing high boots, or even something like um, backpacking or ski gaiters, which work really well and will cinch down um, around your boot and tighten around your lower leg and can prevent ticks from getting access. Uh, ticks, however, will take their time once they get on you. They will walk and cruise until they find um, the perfect place to settle in and bite. They like to go for areas that are not gonna be rubbed by fabric, are also areas that are quite dark and humid. So because of that, and again, we'll have a graphic on this later, they tend to uh, go in and attach to places that are you know, behind the knees, um, behind the ears, in the hairline, in the groin area. So these are all areas though that don't have direct contact with fabric a lot. So it's actually kind of rare to actually find ticks attaching on like the outer front portion of the knee or on your elbow where they may be rubbing against a shirt you're wearing. Uh, ticks don't actually like that. And so they frequently will actually try out quite a few places before they actually settle in, uh, tuck themselves in, you know, kind of strap the napkin on and, and really uh, start feeding for you. So the barbed hypostome or the beak of the tick, this is very similar again, as I said before, to the proboscis you see on mosquitoes, they frequently have a small little barb. So they almost look like an arrow or spearhead. Um, these help to anchor the tick once it actually attaches and starts feeding. So it means that unlike black flies or mosquitoes, once the tick is attached and feeding, they don't readily come out very quickly. Uh, oftentimes you will find that ticks take a very long time to actually detach from a host. Um, and so as a consequence, when people are removing ticks, if they are, are very quick and trying to really get the tick off quickly with a pair of tweezers, it's not uncommon to actually rip the head off of the tick while you're trying to remove it because those barbed um, points on the hypostome actually remain lodged and anchored under the skin. And so in, in general, we do advocate for folks to take gentle, slow uh, tugging with a tweezer in order to remove the tick fully. If you have to remove a tick, and the barbed hypostome is still remaining under your skin, there is no issue with transmission of tick-borne pathogens from that piece of tissue. However, you can get a secondary infection like you would with a splinter or a thorn under your skin. Um, so we do recommend putting a topical antiseptic on it and eventually it will probably um, work its way out the same way a sliver or a thorn will um, from under your, under your skin. Um, in general, the hypostome is the only part of the body that will uh, lodge itself under your skin. It is possible, however, with some people as well as some animals that your, your body may have an immune response to the tick bite itself. So you may actually get some swelling around the site of the bite, which may make it appear that other parts of the tick are actually burrowing under your skin. When in reality, 
it's just your body having an immune response to the tick bite and, and its swelling is kind of crowding in around the tick itself. Um, again, this, this really can make it a little bit more difficult when you're extracting the tick. So again, using a fine pair of forceps will be uh, very handy in getting the tick off. And we really don't advocate doing things like applying Vaseline or using a hot match or, or uh, open flame to get those ticks off um, because you know, it can result in one injury to yourself, uh, but also it can also cause a tick to regurgitate some of the contents of its blood meal back into you, which is not something you really want. Unlike mosquitoes or black flies, ticks actually um, will inject an anesthesia, which means you don't feel the bite the same way you would with a black fly or mosquito. And there's an anti anticoagulant that will also help keep the blood flowing. In wildlife, this can occur over several days. So it's actually a, an evolutionary device that the tick uses to keep that blood flow going so it can get fully engorged uh, in capacity. Common misconceptions, ticks do not fly, jump, or in general, climb trees. Um, they are consummate hitchhikers that are out waiting on the ground or, or in low vegetation, waiting to attach to you. Um, you think of it as, as they're kind of waiting for an embrace. You know, they're out there on, on the edge of a shrub or a piece of grass with their two legs out, uh, just waiting to hook onto your clothing um, or, or the hide of an animal as, as you walk by. So they really think of them as consummate hitchhikers. Uh, and again, you know, they don't fly um, or jump on, onto people or pets. Um, and so, as I said before, we have about 14 different species that occur in Maine for ticks. Um, two, the American dog tick and the deer or black-legged tick are probably our most common. We also have a tick called the woodchuck tick, which can get onto folks. Um, and this is a tick that is a little bit rarer. It's associated with different forms of wildlife than either the dog tick or the, or the deer tick. Um, and is really associated with woodchucks and also animals like mustelids. So things like fisher or weasels or skunks will actually get this tick on them frequently. Um, but as a consequence, because it can get on things like skunks or woodchucks, it can it can get quite close to your home. And there have been cases of people who have been bitten by this tick. Um, and it is a vector of a virus called Powassan virus that we have had cases of in Maine. Um, and so it is one that we do you know want to warn people about. And this is really a reason to to try to minimize uh, wildlife denning in areas very close to where you're going to be spending time uh, on your property. Um, so, you know, really, if you have dens of skunks, woodchucks adjacent to your porch, your deck, your house, your garage, anywhere where you're going to be spending time, it's probably a good idea to try to minimize uh, animals denning in those areas because uh, they can bring ticks in fairly close to, to your homes as a consequence. We have two ticks that we would consider exotic that we do not believe are, are yet established in Maine, but they are of, of public health or veterinary health concerns. One of these is the Lone Star tick. Uh, a tick that is native to the U.S. but does occur primarily or originally in southern portions of the U.S. because it's considered more of a tropical climate tick. Uh, this tick has a natural historic range stretching from Oklahoma and Texas all the way through the south, south, southeast um, to the mid-Atlantic around Virginia. In recent years, however, it has been expanding itself into the northeast, where it is now established in parts of New Jersey, New York, and uh, southern New England, Connecticut, and coastal Massachusetts. Uh, there are areas of the coastal mass in the last five years where this tick has become established, and it's sort of like the northern range extension in the northeast for this tick. Um, this is one that is transported by migratory songbirds, so it is possible we will have this tick imported into Maine at some point in the future. Um, currently, we do not yet have this uh, tick present in Maine in, in an established population. Another tick is one called the Asian longhorn tick, which it's unclear really how this tick was introduced to the U.S., but it is a tick that has a native range in, in the Pacific Rim countries in Asia, all the way down to Australia and New Zealand. Uh, it is a vector of some diseases, but it's primarily a parasite of, of livestock, and it can cause several diseases in livestock, uh, resulting in, in widespread mortality among livestock species such as goats and cattle. Um, it was first discovered in the U.S. in 2017 in a, in a farm in New Jersey, and has since spread to at least 13 different states, stretching all the way from Connecticut down to Kentucky and Tennessee. So it, has, it is incrementally expanding its range. It has a wide variety of wildlife hosts. The one silver lining with this tick, I guess if you can call it, is that we are really not a preferred host for this tick. Uh, it does prefer things like raccoons, deer, foxes, um, other forms of, of urban associated wildlife. Uh, in general, it doesn't seem as inclined to bite people, although 
given the chance, I'm sure it would. Um, so we are on the lookout for both of these ticks, however, since they have not yet arrived in Maine uh, in established populations. But it is something that we are um, on the lookout for, as are several other states in, in uh, the Northeast. So as I said before, ticks have several life stages. Uh, in fact, they have four. Uh, the egg, which is, of course, is a, is a non-mobile stage of the tick. And then we have larvae when they hatch out um, of their eggs. The nymph, which is the middle or teenage or juvenile stage of the ticks, which is about the size of a poppy seed. And it is the life stage most responsible for human cases of Lyme disease. Uh, it's the one that we frequently refer to as the size of the head of a pin. And then we have the adult stage, which is about the size of a sesame seed or apple seed. Um, seasonally, there's a difference in when these tick life stages are active. Uh, larvae tend to be more active in August and September. Uh, those ticks, those larval ticks that are able to feed on a host like a mouse or a chipmunk, will then fill with blood over winter and emerge sometime in Maine around the end of May, beginning of June. And the nymphal season for us coincides with a lot of the human cases of Lyme disease uh, really reaching a peak in June, July, and early August. Uh, those nymphal ticks that are out and are able to feed will engorge with blood, drop into the leaf litter, and then emerge out the following October as the adult life stage. And adult life stage deer ticks are very common in October and November. Recent years with milder winters, we are seeing them active into December and even January now. Um, those ticks which are not able to feed on a wildlife host during the fall and early winter will go under uh, the leaf litter for the, the coldest parts of the season and then emerge out when spring hits. And, and they will, uh, those remainders will be active in questing frequently in March, April, and in May in Maine. Uh, and again, this is just a life cycle seasonally showing when the different life stages of the ticks are out. And I just kind of summarize this with the last uh, last bit of dialogue. But again, you know, what we're seeing now really a take home is that at one time, you know, we really could count on the tick season in Maine ending around Veterans Day or Thanksgiving. And that really doesn't seem to be the case, especially in the southern counties of Maine, York, Cumberland, Sagadahawk, uh, some of the coastal counties like Lincoln County. Where I live, you know, we have been finding deer ticks easily into the first week of January uh, in recent years because it has been so mild. So I, I think it really just the public health message really should be, you know, there's really not a safe time to think that you're calendar wise going to be avoiding ticks. You know, they're, they're, we're really looking at them now as almost a 10 month occurrence in, in the state of Maine if we have mild winters. Uh, so that is something that, you know, folks really should try to remember. Um, you know, the, the adult stage ticks, you could be out, you know, walking around Christmas and if you don't have a lot of snow and it's close to 40 degrees out on your property, there's a good chance that ticks could still be out and active at that time. But with deer ticks, you know, we, they, they're not everywhere on the landscape. You know, there are areas that they don't like and there are areas that are much preferable from a habitat perspective. Uh, in general, deer ticks really tend to prefer deciduous or mixed forest, you know, usually um, composed of oak, maple, to a lesser extent pine. Uh, they like a heavy to moderate shrub layer occurring, and then they like that thick duff or leaf litter layer, which acts as an insulating blanket and a, and a protective area for them during periods of environmental extremes, either extreme cold in the winter or things like drought occurring uh, later on in the summer. Ticks may not die off so much as simply go into a quote unquote hibernation phase where they crawl into the leaf litter and just hunker down and wait until a drought condition um, goes by and we start getting rain again where they may then emerge. Similarly, the leafy canopy of a, of a forest uh, or dense shrub layer is protective uh, for ticks from drying out from excessive sun or excessive wind. Um, some work done since 2000 forward to now looking at different ecological habitats for ticks are finding that within the shrub layer, you know, things like invasive shrubs, um, examples like Japanese barberry, Eurasian honeysuckle, Asiatic bittersweet, are providing really good habitat for ticks because they form such dense impenetrable thickets. Uh, they're really good protective cover for the ticks. It's not so much that we have a magic bush, um, you know, that we we think of uh, that that ticks like, but it's it's more just the habitat structure and the protective barrier to sun and wind that prevent the ticks from drying out. That that really helps them. And unfortunately, a lot of our invasives um, are aggressive. They grow quite fast, and they frequently grow without competitors. Uh, or or animals that browse them. And so they can take over a forest understory very effectively uh, and provide excellent tick habitat where they get established. 
By contrast, deer ticks don't like open dry habitats, uh, areas with a lot of sun and wind ripping across, you know, your open uh, lawns that get a lot of sun and wind during the day and summertime don't provide great tick habitat. Uh, most tick exposure is really going to occur, um, you know, really pretty close to your woodland barrier around your yard. Um, and so open open areas with a lot of um, mown grass and where your leaves have been raked off um, don't provide great tick habitat. So it's a good IPM strategy around homes to think about, you know, cutting your grass down, removing your shrubs from very close to your homes, um, and then also removing your, your fallen leaves as well uh, off your property. So seasonally, winter ticks out. So um, as I mentioned before, you know, the, the nymphal deer ticks, which you can see with the blue line, really tend to start emerging in, in Maine around the mid to late parts of May peaking around June and early July, and then tapering off by about the second or third week of August or so. Um, this is then followed by the subsequent adults emerging out in the fall. And, and for us, we really see, tend to see them, uh, the adult ticks coming out towards the last week of September, first week of October, really spiking towards the second, third week of the month. Um, and then uh, tapering off as we start to get colder. And now historically, again, as I said, you know, we used to think of the tick season really wrapping up around Veterans Day or Thanksgiving, but we really can't go by that bellwether anymore. You know, we're having much more milder winters, especially in coastal counties in southern Maine, um, you know, where the ticks are are active now frequently into what we consider, quote unquote, winter months. Um, when we're looking at the ecology of the different ticks, they are a little bit different. And so when I was talking about deer ticks being associated with forested areas with a lot of open canopy, because they dry out very quickly, um, that does not apply to dog ticks. Dog ticks, by contrast, are uh, a much hardier tick. Uh, they don't dry out as easily. They really do well because of the different wildlife they feed on. They're very, very common in open and grassy fields. Um, and this time of year, as we're getting into the peak season for dog ticks to be out, um, you know, it's not uncommon to go out into a grassy area and come out with 50 or 60 dog ticks in an area where you may maybe find, you know, one to two deer ticks by contrast. Uh, and so dog ticks are hyper abundant this time of year, um, really, you know, April through August. And, and really for this, even though we do find some in August, it's really April through June is the, the major push of the season. And by the time July hits, dog ticks are getting very hard to find um, on the landscape. By contrast, the woodchuck ticks, they don't really quest. They're not really out on the landscape the same way deer ticks and dog ticks are. They tend to hunker in very close to the nests or dens of their wildlife hosts. And so as a consequence, even though people find them more in the summer months, probably when they're down or they're out recreating, um, you know, it's possible if you're working with wildlife to actually find these ticks on their wildlife hosts throughout the year. Uh, you know, we have done studies where we're looking at harvested fisher um, being trapped in December and January. And these ticks, because they live in the burrows of their hosts, are active that time of year very well. And they're, they're doing just fine in, in the warm, cozy burrows of a lot of their hosts. You know, by contrast, they're not out on the landscape, though, because conditions are, are a lot harsher for them. So ticks are spreading in Maine. Uh, Maine, unlike Vermont, um, or unlike I should say Rhode Island or Connecticut, you know, ticks are, are not established completely statewide yet. You know, we still have parts of the state, and this is seen also in Vermont, New Hampshire, where the ticks are emerging and they're expanding their ranges uh, into northern and eastern areas in Maine. So we now have outlying populations of the ticks being found in, in the downeast region in Washington County, and also small outliers that are now showing up uh, in, in kind of our northern counties. So we have areas in Somerset County, kind of on a quarter of along Route 201, stretching from Skowhegan to Jackman, where we see a gradient of these ticks being found closer to Skowhegan, tapering off slightly as you get closer to the Quebec border, but they are expanding every year, going more and more further north. Um, we have small populations that are occurring now in Arista County and Upper Penobscot County. You know, there's small outliers around Holton, Presque Isle, um, areas where they're just getting going, I think indicating that that there's still room for expansion for the for the deer tick in Maine, uh, and I think we will see the range expand more as time goes by. In southern Maine, you know, really, if if you were to take a line, you can kind of see this with the map here, uh, which is prevented, uh, which is presented from the, the University of Maine Cooperative Extension, taking a line drawing starting really at at Mount Desert Island where Bar Harbor is, going up to about Bangor, Orono, Millinocket, and then cranking over to about Rangeley, and anywhere south and west of that line you're really looking at, at the established 
kind of stable, steady state for where deer ticks are. You know, they're pretty well established in this part of the state, and and they're not really going to go anywhere. You know, they're they're really hunkered in, and and they're doing quite well in those areas. Um, you know, where available habitat and and wildlife hosts are present. Um, but northern and eastern tiers, we do have certainly rooms for expansion. And now there are several things that actually affect ticks and and their activity. Uh, precipitation in general, ticks like it. Overall, ticks like it when it's damper and wetter. Uh, as a consequence, we do see ticks much more established and doing much better, especially in dry years along the coastal plain. Within about 10 miles or so of the seacoast, uh, the coastal humidity oftentimes can sustain ticks, even in the absence of, of really regular rainfall occurring. Um, and again, tying in with humidity. Temperature, uh, you know, they really do require um, uh, some stable warm temps to keep going. And this actually comes into play a lot when you're talking about climate change, because we certainly are seeing with our milder temps, you know, a much longer season in the fall and frequently an earlier start to the tick season in the spring as our winters are, are kind of getting shorter a little bit. Uh, you know, certainly the, the ticks in the spring coming out, you know, can be kind of halted for a day or two. When we get a, a snowstorm coming in like we saw this past March. But because the temps warm up fairly quickly, that snow disappears within a few days usually, and the ticks can come back out. And, and in general, you know, a lot of our, our winters that we're having now are not going to be too prohibitive to the ticks, and they seem to survive them uh, just fine. And finally, you know, we have wildlife populations, and, and some research that's been done in New England, uh, Maine, Massachusetts, and Connecticut has looked and found that things like populations of white-tailed deer, you know, the more deer you have in an area, the, the higher your tick population is going to be. Um, a lot of the juvenile ticks uh, feed on a lot of different rodent species. Uh, you know, we have mice, chipmunks, squirrels, shrews, voles, and a whole host of migratory songbirds that the ticks will feed on during the summertime. Uh, many of these species also act as the actual reservoirs for the tick-borne pathogens. Uh, and so, you know, certainly, you know, the, the increased abundance of those uh, wildlife species means a greater potential for tick-borne disease. Uh, and again, habitat availability, remembering the ticks in general don't like open, dry uh, habitats, you know, so where you have your deciduous forests with a lot of shrubs and especially invasive shrubs really provides excellent tick uh, habitat. Just looking forward with climate change as a possibility, you know, one predicting um, model uh, from the University of Maine looks at how warm things might be going forward over the next 50 years or so. And, uh, and really, you know, we are seeing that as the temps warm in Maine, we have more of Maine that is going to become more hospitable to, to deer ticks and, and their potential expansion. So I think it is something um, that we do need to consider as, as a possible effect of climate change. Uh, you know, certainly as we're doing work on mosquitoes as well, we do have issues with climate change affecting mosquito populations in addition. Uh, but for ticks, really, you know, the, the temps and the increase in temps means that we're going to have longer seasons and greater survivability of ticks, um, you know, as you, as you go uh, into the future. Now, tick-borne disease in general is uh, affects all ages. Um, you know, there aren't really one type or one cohort of people where we're um, that are are avoiding tick-borne disease. Uh, in general, though, the the highest age cohorts for exposure to ticks tend to be kids under the ages of five to fourteen, and then adults over the age of sixty-five. And a lot of this is probably due to habits and activities that people are doing at this time. You know, kids outside are playing a lot in, outdoors. Um, they're down low to the ground, and they frequently get exposed to ticks, and they may not do tick checks as 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 often. Um, over the age of 14, you, know, you can kind of think of maybe of, of the Xbox coming into play at that point, and so maybe kids may not be spending as much time outside. So we do see lower numbers of ticks uh, or tick bites affecting uh, people, uh, kids from ages like 15 to 24 or so. Um, generally, adults over the age of 65, if they're in the retirement phase, they may be doing more outdoor recreational activities during retirement, such as gardening, hiking, walking, uh, fishing, hunting. And, and so, they, it, again, it's more or less just a lifestyle and, and exposure risk from activity in, that, in those age categories. Um, so we have actually a whole suite of different tick-borne diseases that are affecting uh, people and, and pets in Maine. Our most common are three diseases. Uh, Lyme disease is our most common, followed by anaplasmosis and babesiosis. All three of these are transmitted by the deer tick or black-legged tick. Rare incidence of a disease called ehrlichiosis or a relapsing fever or powassan encephalitis have also been reported in Maine. Ehrlichiosis, however, tends to be associated with lone star tick bites. And, and it's really a question as to whether or not 
when people have ehrlichiosis, whether it's been acquired in Maine through activity in Maine, or is it something like a travel exposure where they've maybe gone on vacation down south, been bitten by a Lone Star tick in a state south of us, come back to Maine and, and um, have symptoms showing up after they arrive back from vacation. Um, the hard tick relapsing fever is transmitted by deer ticks at a much lower level. And Powassan encephalitis is transmitted by both deer ticks and also the woodchuck tick. We have found it in general statewide, um, but in general, we don't have very many cases a year. Uh, two cases a year would be very high for us. On average, we have about one case a year occurring in Maine. Powassan is um, of interest because it is a very severe disease. It's a virus and not a bacterial infection. And we have had fatalities of this disease reported in Maine. Potential diseases that we don't have yet, but are hosted by other ticks like Lone Star ticks could be uh, spotted fever rickettsias, a disease called tularemia, and also heartland virus, which have been reported in other parts of the US. Uh, and so again, just a breakout of the ticks and the different diseases they carry. Uh, and you can see here that the deer tick, you know, because of just the, the vast number of pathogens it carries is probably our most important tick from a public health or veterinary health perspective. Uh, and again, the Lone Star tick, even though it carries quite a few pathogens, it's not yet established in Maine, but is one that we are on the lookout for. And so Lyme disease, I'm going to go into the individual diseases a little bit. Um, Lyme disease is a bacterial or spirochetal disease that is transmitted by the deer tick, but the tick needs to actually be attached and feeding for at least 24 hours to transmit to people. So uh, the preventive measure of doing tick checks and removing ticks early is an excellent method uh, of helping to minimize uh, this disease uh, where it occurs. Now, this is not one of those things where it's 100% of the time, it's always 24 hours. It, it is possible, and, and there have been studies that have looked at pulling a tick off. Um, you know, you may actually, if you're pulling a tick off with tweezers or, or some other device and you cause a tick to regurgitate its stomach contents back into you because it is traumatized by, say, a hot pin, um, you know, it's possible, in theory, that you could have Lyme uh, regurgitated back into you. Uh, in advance of 24 hours if you're removing a tick off with, with some of these different methods. So again, uh, even in the vast majority of cases, the tick needs to be attached and feeding for 24 hours. Um, but, you know, there are exceptions to that rule. Uh, early symptoms of Lyme incur, uh, occur uh, usually in the first month after a tick bite uh, include a rash, usually referred to as a bullseye rash. This is because you have a red area at the center followed by an outer white line, and then finally an outer barrier of dark, uh, reddish pink, um, usually occurs uh, at the site of the bite, though not always, and can occur um, in different shapes. It is not always uh, a perfect circle. Uh, and some of this depends on where on the body the bite has occurred. So certainly if you have a tick bite on your arm, the, the rash itself may elongate out to the shape of your arm as opposed to having this occur on, on your torso. Uh, fever and chills, fatigue, and muscle or joint soreness are also very common within the first month of a tick bite. Uh, and again, this is just a photo looking at where the different bullseye rashes might appear and look like. One thing that I, I do want to mention is that many people will get a raised red uh, swelling at the site of a tick bite when they pull the tick off. This is not a symptom of Lyme disease. This is not the bullseye rash, but more of an immune response to the tick biting you. Uh, very similar to people that swell up from a black fly bite after a black fly will, will bite you in the springtime. Um, people that, anecdotally, it's been reported that people that frequently get tick bites become more sensitive to those bites. So your immune response is actually a reaction to the tick biting you. Uh, in some ways, it's, it's like your body's early defense mechanism telling you you've got a tick on you before that 24 hour mark. At least that's how I look at it because I, you know, being exposed to ticks a lot, I do get bites, um, you know, uh, but my body is very sensitive now to a tick bite. And, and so it's not uncommon to, to find that that raised red area feels very sore for, for quite a few days after you take the tick off. But again, there's not the bullseye rash associated with Lyme disease. Later symptoms may include arthritis, neurologic, memory, or, or cognitive problems, as well as in very rare cases, heart, uh, heart issues that have been reported. Lyme disease is distributed, quote unquote, nationally, but really has hotter spots occurring in the upper Midwest and the Northeast. Um, a lot of this has to do with the wildlife hosts that we have present on the landscape. 
All, all those areas of the country have large amounts of white-tailed deer, as well as abundant rodent populations. Um, this is in contrast to as you go down south, where instead of rodents, a lot of the deer ticks actually feed on things like lizards and snakes. Uh, and you're going down to the southeastern parts of the country. What happens in the southeast is that these animals, lizards and snakes, are not um, great reservoirs for a lot of the tick-borne pathogens. And so the ticks that bite them actually have a much lower infection rate. So in, by contrast, you could take ticks that we might collect here in Kennebec County, test them in the fall, and you may have about a 50% infection rate with Lyme disease. If you were to go out at the same time down to Florida or Georgia, take a similar collection of ticks, that infection rate may be under 2% by contrast. And that's simply because ticks are feeding on different wildlife hosts, and some of those wildlife hosts are not very good reservoirs for pathogens. Uh, we do consider Lyme disease to be a statewide issue in the state. Uh, it certainly has expanded over the last 25 years to now it's reported from every county in the state, um, albeit coastal counties in general tend to have a higher uh, degree of disease reporting. And of course, the number of cases has also gone up each year. We certainly have years, however, where we have dips. Um, in particular, you know, we have years like 2015 and 2020, which were very dry years um, where we didn't have a whole lot of moisture. And we saw, as a reflection, fewer cases of Lyme disease being reported in those years. Uh, 2000, by contrast, 2017 and 2019 were actually very wet years uh, with a lot of tick activity. And so, as a consequence, uh, we had more disease reporting in, in those years occurring. And again, you know, the, the timing of Lyme disease cases really tends to fall within the southern months of, of the year. Uh, and this coincides a lot with the nymphal stage of the deer tick, which is very small and very difficult for people to find, uh, which is probably why most of our cases are reported at this time of the year. Oftentimes, uh, it's not the tick that you find that gives you Lyme disease, it's the one you don't find. And when ticks are very small, you know, smaller than the head of a pin, uh, you really have to do very, very discreet tick checks to find those ticks on you. And this is again just showing up, looking at where cases are occurring in, in uh, relation to the different life stages of the deer tick. Uh, and again, adult de stage deer ticks do cause some human disease. We certainly do have cases reported when the adult ticks are out in the fall and spring. But in general, uh, some early work done back in the early 80s found that most cases of canine Lyme disease that were reported in New England fell within the fall and, and spring months when the adult stage of the ticks were out. So they certainly do um, compose a veterinary issue at that time of the year as well. And again, this is just a, a breakout of the different uh, age groups that, that have the most cases of tick-borne disease. And really it's that um, you know over 65 and under five years of age, um, or actually no, it's actually the five to 14, um, and over 65 tend to really be the ones that have the most uh, cases of disease being reported. And in general, the most common symptom that is found on average is the bullseye rash being found among patients, uh, followed up by arthritis uh, being present. Um, and then there are things like cardiac and, and neurologic, which are far lower than either the bullseye rash or, or arthritis as a symptom. Uh, anaplasmosis is our second most common tick-borne pathogen that we see in Maine, uh, also spread by the deer tick and also within 24 hours of, of a tick bite. So again, getting ticks off early is an excellent uh, method to kind of reduce your exposure to these pathogens. Some of the symptoms are very similar to that what we see in Lyme disease, fever, chills, headache, um, muscle pain instead of joint pain, uh, but also things like nausea and abdominal pain, along with difficulty breathing, uh, kidney issues, and also neurologic problems. Anaplasmosis, however, is very treatable with, with common antibiotics such as doxycycline and resolves fairly quickly and successfully with, with treatment. Um, anaplasmosis, like Lyme, has increased over time. However, it is much uh, seen much less than, than Lyme disease. Uh, you know, in 2022, we had over 2,000 cases of Lyme reported in the state. Uh, we had about 800 plus in the same year. So it, it's seen uh, far less frequently but is widely distributed and is something that people should be aware of uh, on the landscape. The BCOSIS is also spread by the deer tick. Um, the transmission time is about 36 to 48 hours to, uh, to become infected. It, is, it has other mechanisms of, of uh, in, in transmission as well. It has been documented that the BCOSIS, because it does exist in the red blood cells of people, 
uh, can be uh, transmitted through contamination with blood transfusions. And so agencies like the Red Cross now do regular screening of uh, blood from states where babesiosis has been reported uh, to look for contaminated blood that can then be taken out of the, of the blood supply. Similarly, there has been uh, data showing that there is transmission of babesiosis from mother to children during pregnancy as well. Um, again, symptoms, fever and chills is pretty common across a lot of the tick-borne pathogens. Uh, anemia, having lower red blood cells, is, is also very characteristic for babesia, as well as um, headache and fatigue. Uh, babesiosis is treatable with a different course of antibiotics than, than Lyme or anaplasma, um, but is not as severe in general unless patients have had um, an issue with their spleen. Uh, people that have had their spleens removed tend to show a higher degree of severe symptoms of babesia, uh, and there has been fatalities reported from this pathogen. Uh, babesia is seen far less frequently than either Lyme or anaplasma. And again, looking at 2022, if you remember from the earlier slides, we had about 2,000 cases of Lyme disease occurring in 2022. We had uh, close to 800 being reported for anaplasmosis. By contrast, um, we had about 200 cases reported for Babesia last year. So again, it is seen widely, especially on the coastal plain of Maine, but the numbers overall are far less than what we would see for other tick-borne pathogens. Um, hey, Chuck, and again, um, the, the relapsing fever that I mentioned oops, earlier, Chuck, I'm, by I'm contrast, and just suggest that we go maybe to slide 47 um, sure. to talk about, start talk about uh, some of the prevention, just okay. being aware of the time. We have about 15 minutes okay. in our schedule. We'll have cool. a little bit of time for questions. Sorry to interrupt okay. you. Nope. It's really That's fine. I was getting the yeah, probably very interesting. The <laughs> yep. um, okay, so tick bite prevention. Okay, a lot of this is stuff that probably a lot of you have heard. And at least as far as prevention methods go, there hasn't been a whole lot of, of revolution in, in kind of the messaging and the techniques that we use. Uh, as I mentioned before, biggest exposure to ticks occur at the lower levels. Most ticks are gonna be down fairly close to the ground. And so having your open cuffs on your pants is gonna be um, a big way that people are gonna get exposed to ticks. So closing that off, either wearing high boots, uh, pulling your socks up over your cuffs, or buying some type of gaiter. Certainly companies like L.L. Bean, Cabela's, um, forestry suppliers actually sell things that are called tick gaiters, which are just a, a neoprene or elastic sleeve that will go over the cuff of your pant and, and go down over the top of your boot. That actually works pretty well. Um, if we're doing a lot of heavy field work, we tend to rely more on things like your Wellington muck boot, bog boot, or something like a, a ski or backpacking gaiter which will actually protect your legs from thorny vegetation, as well as, as closing off uh, the bottoms of your, of your pants. Uh, repellents are excellent to use. We really use permethrin a lot on our clothing. Uh, this is a compound that sprays on and can last several wash cycles. And as long as the clothing is not uh, heavily nylon or rubber, such as your rubber boots, uh, it tends to adhere to clothing pretty well. And usually the advice is to let it sit for 24 hours before going into the field. Um, when wet, permethrin can be toxic to cats. So if you're applying it via spray, do it in an area where cats are not gonna have access to your clothing while it is drying. But after it does dry within 24 hours, uh, you should be good to go. DEET is also something that's applied frequently and can be applied to the skin as well as clothing. You, a lot of the data out there shows you don't need to go higher than 28% concentration of DEET. Uh, that tends to be the most effective bang for your buck. You certainly can get DEET up to 100% that you can splash on, but that's really not necessary to go that high. And then for your pets, you can apply either orally or a top spot medicine to control ticks and fleas. Um, these are present for cats as well as dogs. Um, all the cats, I believe, just have currently a, a topical that you apply. Uh, Frontline is probably the most common one. Dogs, however, have the option of having either a top spot or an oral medicine that they can take. Uh, and again, a wide variety of, of different uh, topical sprays and repellents that you can apply. Um, DEET is probably the most common, but we have compounds with the active ingredients such as something called IR3535, which has a very long uh, activity life once you apply it. Also, lemon oil of eucalyptus is a more natural compound that is now in sprays that can be applied and is effective at repelling ticks as well as mosquitoes. However, the botanicals, these natural compounds in general, tend to break down a lot quicker, especially if you're getting rained on or if you're sweating a lot. So they need to be applied a lot more frequently than some of the synthetics. 
Uh, and again, you know, just getting back to the topic about DEET, which is probably our most common compound used, you know, again, you don't need to really go higher than 28% concentration. Um, you know, if you do go higher, you're just adding more chemical. Um, if you're going less for concentration, it can still be effective. You can buy DEET at like a 17% concentration. Still effective as a repellent, you just need to apply it more often to yourself or your clothing. And again, where do you find ticks? So ticks, again, like those areas that are not going to be rubbed by fabric, that are going to be dark and kind of protected and, and damp and moist. So really looking at around behind the ears, under the hairline, uh, your armpits, the groin area, and behind the knees are probably the most common areas where, um, where ticks are found. If you're coming in from the from the field, obviously taking a shower to wash off any unattached ticks is a great idea, but putting your clothes in the dryer before washing is very effective at killing ticks. Uh, putting the ticks, putting the clothes in the dryer for up to 15 minutes on high heat will very effectively kill ticks because putting your clothing just in the regular wash with detergent will not kill ticks. If it's lighter colored clothing and you're adding chlorine bleach, that may effectively kill ticks in the wash, but a regular detergent will not. Uh, and the ticks can still be alive on your clothing after you remove them uh, from the washing machine. So if you do find a tick attached, what do you do with it? Well, you know, um, you know, using tweezers or something like a tick spoon, which you can get at a lot of vet facilities or you can buy them at, at outdoor supply places, uh, work really well for removing the tick and actually getting the beak or hypostome out of the tick as well. Um, and then monitoring yourself for, for symptoms such as fever, chills uh, for up to a month after removing the tick. Certainly giving your physician, your primary care doctor a call is an excellent idea if you have a tick removed. Um, you know, but again, removing the ticks, you don't want to use things like nail polish, matches, petroleum jelly. Uh, none of these are really effective and they can cause a tick to become agitated. And if it does, it may actually regurgitate back into you um, some of the stuff that's in its, its existing blood meal. So the tick spoons and, and tweezers kind of act almost as a crowbar to take the ticks out. And, and again, with this, you know, it's very, um, very effective at removing ticks on both yourself as well as companion animals. Um, the tick spoons in particular work very effective with pets because they, um, dogs and cats learn pretty quickly about sharp objects. And if they get used to you coming up to them with the tweezers, they may shy away from that, where the tick spoons are largely non-threatening. And, and so they are very effective at leveraging a tick out from the skin. And then the small cup will actually help to contain the tick while you can find um, a container to drop it in. And once the tick is removed, you can place it in a small crush-proof, waterproof container with some rubbing alcohol. And then if you want, uh, you can submit it to areas like the University of Maine Cooperative Extension, where they do tick identification free of charge, but can also test your tick for pathogens. Uh, Maine residents are only charged about $15 a submission uh, or tick, uh, per tick. Uh, so it's a fairly reasonable um, if you want to have your tick tested. And again, this is the website. And again, Allison will have information up on the web as well about uh, the Humane Cooperative Extension Program uh, for doing tick submissions. Uh, and again, you know, one of the things we do want to say is that the tick testing services, even if you get a tick that's tested positive that you have removed from yourself, it's not a guarantee that that tick will be transmitting disease to you. Um, you know, if the tick is, if you find a tick on you and it's only been on for four or five hours, it may be a deer tick, it may be infected with Lyme, but it may not have been on long enough to actually transmit pathogens to you. So really, you know, monitoring symptoms um, is really one of the things that, that people really advocate uh, in, the, in the clinical world is to monitor for symptoms. And then when you do develop symptoms, uh, you know, contact your physician. Um, but it's not a bad idea to contact them anyway, as soon as you get a tick off. But certainly when symptoms appear, uh, you know, be, it's good to get on the horn and, and give them a ring and let them know. Um, so if you do start to feel well or unwell at following a tick bite, you know, and you, this is usually not within a day or two, this is usually about maybe seven to 30 days out after removing a tick is when most symptoms will show up. You know, remember that most tick-borne diseases, especially the bacterial infections are treatable with antibiotics. Um, Powassan virus has no treatment because it is a viral disease. Uh, we have what is called supportive therapy. Uh, at, at, a, at medical facilities, because Powassan can be quite severe and can result in things like encephalitis, um, you know, it, it may require hospitalization. Um, but again, most of the bacterial infections from Lyme are treatable with antibiotics. Making your yard safer. So most tick-borne bite, most tick bites actually occur at the site of, of your home, um, as opposed to being on actually recreating. If you think about 
those of you that may live, especially in suburban or ex-urban parts of Maine with a, with a woodland belt behind you, it's not uncommon to run into your backyard, pull some stuff from the garden, uh, mow your lawn, grab your kayaks off, you know, whatever. You're running out. You're not really thinking about being exposed to ticks. Oftentimes, you're maybe out there for only a few minutes, but, you know, we don't really think about dressing properly and, and being tick exposed in those instances, but that can happen. Similarly, uh, pets are a great avenue for having ticks come into your home. And it's not uncommon for people that have dogs and cats to have the dogs and cats, like mine, like to jump up on your couch or your bed, and they certainly can deposit ticks on, on your, your furniture, which can then possibly get on you. Um, so applying top spot medicines or, or anti-tick medicines to your animals is a great way of helping to kill those ticks that get into your home. Um, but then around the yard as well, you know, really the biggest areas for exposure are going to be your, your woodland border. Um, and ticks don't like open exposed areas. So, um, you know, keeping your lawn mowed, uh, getting rid of the leaves that are on your property that provide a nice refuge for ticks during environmental extremes. You know, and keeping things like brush and wood piles where rodents uh, can build up and may actually provide habitat for ticks close to your house um, is a great idea. Uh, during the summer months, it's a good idea to take your bird feeders out because that can attract rodents closer to your home. Uh, and actually then during the summer months as well, birds should probably not be eating bird seed as much as they should be feeding on insects anyway. So there's a double benefit. You're actually in some ways helping your birds out in the summertime when you're doing that. Uh, and then you can do stuff like putting a border around your yard at your wood edge. Uh, you know, it, it's been shown that ticks don't like to crawl over dry substrates. So even things like a stone border or wood chip border may actually prevent um, um, may actually prevent ticks from, from walking over onto your lawn or may deter them to some extent. And it also can provide a behavioral reminder. Uh, you know, or or maybe an area where you can put an invisible fence along to prevent your pets from going into areas where there may be higher tick densities or, you know, kind of remind your kids not to go near the, where the border is or where they may have more encounters with ticks uh, on the edge of your lawn. Uh, and so uh, tick control, various various ideas about that in various scales. It can be done at the individual property level, uh, the neighborhood level or the community level. And so, you know, talking about things like pesticide sprays are possibly an option. Uh, there is also um, doing a lot of habitat management. Getting rid of those invasives in, in an area is a great way to reduce available tick habitat. And you can also do things like fencing and, and excluding wildlife, such as white-tailed deer, from an area. Um, that may help to reduce ticks locally on a property or within a community um, as well. So that's what I've got. We're pretty close to the hour mark at this point. Uh, this is our informational slide with Maine CDC, uh, our lab at the Maine Health Institute for Research, and then also the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. And I think we're gonna go through and try to nail as many of your questions as possible. Uh, I did see a thing about this slideshow. This slideshow um, is one done by the Maine Center for Disease Control. I think Allison, um, has a PDF copy of it that she can post as well um, if folks want to look at that information. So, Terrific. Thank you, Chuck, for confirming yeah. that. Yep. So one of the, I really appreciate the talk first. It's, it's uh, as I said, it's always great to, to hear your presentation on this, just the depth of knowledge and, and uh, the way you present it from a, a field person's perspective. Very, very nice. Is it um, the food analogies for the tick sizes? Because I like food. So it's, it's, yeah, you know, yeah, right, right, yeah. So. Um, so one of the questions that was early on in the chat was regarding guinea fowl and yeah. whether there's any information about whether right. they are really an effective uh, yeah. control or management for ticks. Yeah, we, we get this a lot. Um, so guinea fowl was highlighted a number of years ago, about 25, 30 years ago, um, from some very brief studies that were done in New York. And it, it was found, anybody that owns chickens, knows that chickens are an environmental disaster in the landscape to some extent. They eat anything. <laughs> they devour all the vegetation. They leave my lawn a sandy wasteland, and they eat pretty much anything they encounter. Um, but they are not roaming across the entire landscape. So guinea fowl and chickens probably to some extent will eat some ticks, but these are probably more visible ticks, such as dog ticks, may be a better target for them than the very small deer ticks, which they might not find. Um, so there really hasn't been a whole lot of evidence to say they really impact 
exposure to ticks on, on residential properties. Um, so I think the jury is really out. And it is one of those things we get a lot of questions about that I think is one of those topics we really do need to study and definitively answer because it is certainly something that comes up a lot from folks um, as a possible tick method. And folks, there's a lot of backyard chicken flocks now that people think are, are going to be one of the reasons to get them is to control the ticks on their property. And that may not really be the case in, in some some instances. So. Yeah, thank you. So um, uh, there's some questions about disease, diseases, and I, I think probably best to have those covered by med their people's medical yeah, I, I, I'm not a clinician. My background is in wildlife, so I can talk to the cows come home about deer and mice, um, but I'm not a, a clinician. Um, so I, I, yeah, I usually don't uh, go into medical questions. So okay, uh, a question about um, let's see, Connor has a question about a concept. If I have a concept for prevention and education, who could I send that to for consideration? And um, Connor, I think uh, probably the vector-borne disease work group. CDC yep. with that. Yeah. 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 We have a state born oh. work group um, that we meet uh, every couple of months. Um, it involves state employees, uh, folks in the university, our lab, also private pest control operators are there as well. Um, yeah, certainly. And in, in both Allison and I attend. Um, so, you know, it might be something that if you send it to either of us, um, you know, or or main CDC, um, you know, we, we could bring it up at one of the state meetings. Yeah, so I see in your last slide, there's the disease reporting at maine.gov. So yep. that might be a, a direct yep. way. I, I did pop into the chat our email, foresthealth at maine.gov. Connor, if you were to send your information there, we'd make sure it gets to the right people at CDC um, for, for consideration. A uh, question about can ticks bite through clothes? Right. Ticks, okay, unlike mosquitoes, ticks cannot bite through clothing. Um, so even the thinnest of fabrics will actually be a barrier to them. Um, so, you know, really one of the things we talk about, especially in the summertime, is people don't like to wear long sleeves, right? Because it's hot out, especially when it's 90 degrees in July and humid. But they do make a lot now. They make a lot of what are called, quote unquote, tropic weight fabrics that it can be long sleeve shirts or pants. And these, the thinnest of fabric will actually be a, a, a nice preventative and barrier to ticks biting you. Um, so certainly... In the summertime, you know, those tropic wave fabrics, um, you know, seen a lot in like hiking pants and stuff are, are a great method of, of reducing tick bites in the summer when it's hot out. Question for Denise. I don't know if you know the answer to this. Does permethrin expire? I buy it in bulk, but don't use it all up for years. And I don't know if it'd be a container Boy. label or something. Yeah, that may be something to look at maybe the EPA because honestly, I mine doesn't last that long. My my permethrin gets used up pretty fast um, and I have to buy several cans a year. So uh, I know that it does last about six or seven wash cycles if you apply it, but an old can, I don't know. I uh, Yeah, you may actually, actually write, because there are several manufacturers, you may actually write to a couple of them and see. You know, I actually don't know the answer to that. That's so. a good suggestion. Yeah, oftentimes or always there's a number to call for more information yeah, on exactly, those right. pesticides. Yep. Uh, Amy asked, how long can a tick live without feeding? So uh, if it is moist and damp in the woods, um, a long time, months and months and months, probably. You know, we, we have found that in some cases the tick, even though a deer tick has about a two year life cycle, um, if things don't go well for it, that can extend out to about three and a half, uh, possibly four years, maybe. So, you know, they can they can go to ground for quite a while and, and not feed. So. Honor says he finds when he wears long pants and tuck socks into his pants, um, the ticks simply are forced to climb to higher places, but I can't see or reach as well like my neck or back. Right. Well, and, and part of that is if you if you're wearing treated clothing, uh, that is a time to actually apply permethrin or D to your clothing as, as a repellent. Um, the permethrin, you know, we, we use it pretty exclusively on our on our field clothing. And, um, you know, we find that it works pretty effectively at, at reducing tick exposure. Um, however, you know, we also have all of our clothes tucked in as well. Um, it also, as a, you know, as an aside, this isn't really definitive tick protection, but, you know, if we're doing a lot of field work in the summertime as well, I absolutely hate black flies. I can't stand them. And I have, starting this week, all the way through August. I mean, I have a head net that I'm wearing regularly anyway, but that's just another line of defense around your head and neck area as well. 
you know, to think about if you're doing a lot of work outside and or spending a lot of time outdoors. So. Um, is there any continuing research and development of controlling the reservoir and animal populations, for example, pellets for mice? Yeah, so there there is. There's a bunch of different stuff people are looking at, and some of these are more, you know, kind of experimental scientific de designs, like uh, possibly creating or releasing genetically modified mice that don't act as reservoirs, so possibly they breed and carry on their genes to make non-reservoir mice down the road. Um, there are bait boxes, which are in existence that work pretty well uh, for effectively um, treating mice and chipmunks. So you place these bait boxes around your property. Um, the animals run in, they get coated with the same top spot medicine you would give cats and dogs, and it kills the ticks on those reservoir hosts. Um, there are also the tick tubes, a couple different brands, Daminex and Thermacell are the two most common. Uh, these are pretty targeted at mice because mice will take these permethrin treated cotton balls that are in these tubes, bring them back and line their nests with them. And then that helps to kill the ticks that might be feeding on mice. Um, the tick tubes, however, don't work against chipmunks. Um, and obviously neither the bait boxes nor the tick tubes work against ticks that are feeding on migratory songbirds. So it, it's kind of a mixed bag with that a little bit. Yeah, so you've mentioned before the wildlife, you know, keeping them excluded from your yard yeah. areas is a really right. helpful approach. Yeah. You mentioned briefly some uh, the invasive plants as well as yeah. being uh, uh, something that can that does uh, promote tick abundance. Um, uh, Rachel says our forest workers swear that Avon Skin So Soft is the best tick repellent they've found. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know if <clears throat> Skin So Soft has been really tested against ticks so much, but it actually has been shown to work against chiggers down in the southern U.S. Um, it was actually really got a lot of press back in the 80s and 90s because it was very effective at at repelling chiggers. Um, it may be that ticks are a little different and they may not necessarily be as repelled by it. But one of the things they do make now is a skin so soft um, mixed with other repellents. So you may actually have something like DEET mixed in at a very low concentration. Uh, you can find that, and that actually would work as a as a standard repellent against ticks or mosquitoes. So, oh, in in England. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, and I, I don't know. There may be a different formulation there than what we have here as well. That might be possible. Um, that may be a little bit different, or there may be different ticks there that that they are affecting. So, all right. Well, I think uh, we'll, we'll let folks get out and enjoy this beautiful day, and with okay. the hopefully people learn something. Um, I know I did. I, I didn't realize that permethrin would not stick to my rubber boots. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I, I'll stop yeah. treating those. <laughs> yeah, but. <laughs> uh, yeah, a lot of good information in this tech, and I really appreciate your time okay. today. Yeah, yeah thank absolutely. you. That's great. Okay, thanks a lot. All right, folks. See ya. Bye.